I think if I'm speaking to the youth, I don't know how many uh, youth from overall, I think the two major things I'd love for them to remember is continuous learning and experiential learning in terms of empowering yourself and empowering others. Uh, so to know a little bit about my journey, I think I need to tell you a little bit of my experience first. So uh, especially specifically to um, racism. And so for me, being racialized and being kind of uh, addressed on that goes back to me being a child uh, from grade about grade five, grade six. And I remember the door, my door at my house being knocked on. And when I answered the door, being grade five or six, it was a police officer in uniform. But the police officer wasn't there to kind of help. It was very aggressive in nature. They were looking for one of my older siblings or other people who fit a description. And I was only about grade five, grade six. And I just remember them addressing me in a way that was asked, criminalizing me in a sense that if I was participating, if I was doing anything wrong. And at that point in time, I was in grade six. I probably wanted to go watch Power Rangers or whatever I was doing at that time. But they were addressing me that way. And that was my first impression of me being black and being identified as that in a negative way. Mostly, I was able to acquire, understand through the idea of continuously learning and experiential learning. And the slight difference was continuous learning just means to be open to it, never assuming that you understand everything. And with the knowledge comes opportunities to actually address the issues in a manner that is either more receptive or a manner that actually breaks through and just so you have a better understanding. Experiential learning, in a sense, is to get involved, get engaged, and through that, taking up, our, taking up action, get, building our committees, working with your peers is experiential learning because you'll learn skill sets that also help you to navigate systems. At a base, working with people is always a way to help move forward because if you understand people, you can almost work in any sector. Directly to the things that are faced through anti-Black racism and what I think I've been able to do through that was just in terms of being able to educate myself on the spaces I am in and more importantly, the spaces I will be entering, understanding who are there, the players, the gatekeepers, or those who, who respond with or share my point of view, but also those who do not share it and do not have it. Um, when you start to understand the spaces you're in, even if you are in spaces that are not comfortable or not actually presented well, you start learning and identifying um, allies you sort of identifying um, opportunities where you can push a cause forward or how to approach it and who to talk to. And you, you really much under, start understanding why it is so necessary to um, fight the fight against anti-Black racism, well, just in racism as a whole, because of how the structures are set up. You start to really understand, oh my gosh, these rules are not the right rules. They bar a lot of people. I think for young people answering this call, the biggest thing is to understand when and how to do things in the right spaces. And you navigate tough, tough challenges all the time in terms of how and when to take action, how and when to, to dialogue, how and when that you're gonna step forward. Because another part of it is your own type of self-care. And with the Black Lives Movement that has started now, in my role with United Way, I directly engage the Black community and organizations over 60, 70 plus GTY all the time. But I also understand that even though while we're taking up the fight for anti-racism, a lot of them need a space for self-care, healing, and understanding. And that also goes into this. So as all this, these youth are charging for the cause, which I hear is great for anti-Black racism, it's also in a it's also important to understand the idea to come together as a group to just heal and take a breath and understand while you are pushing forward. And within those first few years of my civic leadership, when I was in my teens and into my early 20s, I became very familiar with the civic landscape, with the political landscape and the barriers that existed specifically for young Black, Indigenous and racialized women. And again, bringing it back to my own personal experience as a Muslim immigrant woman. And and that really opened my eyes to how leadership and civic engagement are developed again through a colonial and patriarchal and white supremacist lens and how that white racial frame that um, again in a colonial world 
directs and guides our thinking is really defining who is considered a leader, who is considered um, capable, and that usually and most often excluded Black, Indigenous, and racialized leaders who brought new ways of thinking and collaborative and co collective forms of leadership to the table and really talked about the needs of our communities. Be coming at it from a gendered lens, there's this um, misunderstanding and this assumption that women, particular, particularly Black, Indigenous, and racialized women, are not interested in leadership, that we do not take on leadership roles, that we're more focused on community care, that we're more, most, more focused on organizing. And I think that really comes from, again, like an essentialist gender binary notion that, you know, if you are a woman, these are the activities you take part in. Uh, and if you're a man, these are the activities you take part in. So completely separate. Um, but again, without looking at how our systems and how our society from the day that we are born tells us and dictates as people of color, as marginalized people, which are the spaces that we're allowed to occupy. And then through our experiences, it tells us which are the spaces that are safe for us, which are the spaces that we will face the least barriers in, when we enter leadership roles. And as a result, and because of, again, as, as a result of things that Chris mentioned, the fact that our communities face completely different sets of challenges that cannot necessarily be addressed through top-down approaches within civic institutions. And sometimes our only chance for being able to heal our communities, to bring together people, to really have honest conversations without the threat of racist violence, misogynist violence, is to go back to the grassroots and do underground organizing.